All right, well, good morning. Good morning, Life Spring Church. Man, it is good. Good to see you guys here this morning. I especially want to give a big welcome to those of you uh, who maybe it's your first time ever in church, maybe your first time back in church in a long time. We are thrilled that you're with us today. Uh, before we get started, next week we're starting a new five-week series called Unmasking the Emoji. During this series, we're going to spend five weeks talking about <coughs> feelings, which I know every single guy in the room you're like, well, I don't have feelings, and I'm going to prove that you do. How many of y'all are Carolina fans? Show, show hands. Show hands. Okay, great. The feeling you're going, the, what you're going to feel tomorrow night after state kicks your butt is somewhere between anger or sadness, okay? And all the state fans will feel joy, but that is a feeling, okay? So, so I know some of you guys, you're like, I don't have feelings. Like, like I used to be like that, but um, I'm telling you that you do, and I'm telling you that if you will understand why you feel the way you feel and what that actually means and let God begin to inform that, uh, man, it'll absolutely change your life. So I'm excited about the next five weeks. Be here, uh, and we'll talk about why we feel what we feel, what it means, and how God wants to deal with um, the way we feel and how we act in light of that. So that'll start next week. This week, we're finishing up a series called All In. The idea we've been talking about all series is that being all in with Jesus means a life that is rearranged around Jesus' agenda. That's what it means to be all in following Jesus. Here's the thing about any all in sort of proposition in our lives, though. Um, <clears throat> that There's never any guarantees. There's never any certainty. There's, there's never any um, guaranteed outcome that we can be assured of, which can make us nervous because every single one of us, regardless of who you are, we all tend to like safety, we like certainty, we like things where we, where we just know what's going to happen and we don't have any unexpected surprises. This is one of the reasons why, for me personally, I don't really relax anytime I'm in the woods because I'm naturally, I'm just a very jumpy person. And if I'm in the woods, whether even if I'm walking with my wife, which is awesome, if I'm in the woods or near the woods, I'm convinced that at any moment a snake is going to jump out and bite me. And that's just going to be a crappy day because then I got to go get a shot, and that just makes things worse. Um, I always have this fear that some giant bear is going to show up, and it's not going to be Winnie the Pooh saying, hello, Dylan. It's going to be a big giant bear saying, come here, lunch, and that's just not going to be good. And so so I'm jumpy. Like, like, here's how jumpy I am. This wasn't even the woods, um, but my wife and I were on a walk one time. We were first dating, and out of the corner of my eye on the, gra on the ground, I saw something brown, and my mind interpreted it as snake, and I'm like, Whoa! and it was pine straw. That's what it was. So, so I'm a naturally jumpy jumpy person. I don't like going places where I don't know for certain what the outcome is. I like no, going places where I can see where I'm walking, where there's no danger around, and like safety is a guarantee. Now, here's the thing. You may have grown up in the woods like my wife did, and you're just like, well, I'm fine doing this. Like, it's not dangerous. But the reality is, even if that is you, that that's still like your comfort zone. And every single one of us, we all have a natural default towards our comfort zone because our comfort zone, even if it's unpredictable to whatever extent, well, we're comfortable with that. We're sure that that's the kind of the dynamic that's going to happen. We all like safety, security, certainty, predictability, regardless of what your comfort zone is or your non-comfort zone is. That's what we all enjoy. So here's where that creates a tension when it comes to following Jesus. When you go in following, all in following Jesus, it's never a guaranteed outcome. Like Jesus does guarantee your salvation, but beyond that, he offers no guarantees. He offers no certainty. He doesn't say, if you do X, this is going to be the outcome beyond spending eternity with him. There are no guaranteed outcomes when you go all in following Jesus. We actually see this played out in the life of a guy named Paul. So Paul's been on all these missionary journeys. And this, at this point in Paul's life, he's in a place called Ephesus. And he's about to leave Ephesus. And as he does that, he's speaking to the elders of the church in Ephesus. And he says, this in Acts 20, verse 22. He says, and now compelled by the Spirit, in other words, the Holy Spirit is leading him here, I'm going to Jerusalem not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. So Paul is being led by God to go to Jerusalem, and his lead in with, to the Ephesian elders is, I have no idea what's going to happen. The only thing that I'm pretty sure is going to happen is it's going to be difficult because every single place the Lord leads me, it's challenging, there are hardships, there are difficulties, and that's what I'm stepping into. 
Now, and let's just be honest. That's not something we really enjoy hearing, is it? Not like, like again, we like safety. We like certainty. We like things to be predictable. And as soon as you hear, okay, following Jesus means no guaranteed outcomes, we tend to kind of throw up our hands and be like, I'm not entirely sure I want to do this. Because if it's not safe, if it's not secure, if it's not certain, then, then, then that just creates this discomfort for us. So, so what in the world do, do we do with that? Well, we'll find out in just a second. Um, but here's kind of where our brain is often. Um, we kind of tend to want to view following Jesus as a bit of a contract between us and Jesus. Like, if I follow Jesus, my life is predictable and it's awesome. Right? Kind of like when we go out to eat, you sit down at a restaurant, and you're like, I assume that if I order blank, the food is going to be awesome, and I won't get food envy over my spouse's food. Right? We, we like that. Right? We, we like to assume, okay, if I go to a movie, I'll enjoy it and not feel like I have wasted two hours of my life. Uh, we like to think if I date this person, it'll be happily ever after, and if I go to the woods, I won't get eaten by Winnie the Pooh. That's just kind of that's just kind of what we like. We like life with guarantees, but here's reality, and this begins to help us navigate the tension between but in, in the unknown of following Jesus. There is not a single thing in life that is guaranteed. Nothing in life is guaranteed. Like, you may go to the restaurant and order the shrimp and grits, and it may be lackluster. I've been there. It's rather depressing. You may date somebody who you think is just awesome, and the hallelujah course breaks out every time they walk in the room, and then they turn out to be a jerk. And it might happen. You might like switch careers or something like that, thinking that it's going to be awesome and that it's like going to launch you into something new. And then it turns out to really be like this really big letdown. There's not a single thing in life that is guaranteed ever. No guarantees in life. No guarantees in following Jesus. So what do we do with that? How, 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 how do we navigate that? I would say that one of the ways we navigate that is when we begin to adjust the goal in a lot of ways, when we begin to redefine the question that we're asking. Because the goal of following Jesus is not to get something out of following Jesus. The goal in following Jesus is simply to be faithful, regardless of the outcome. Like we actually see Jesus express that in a story he told where, where about you know, guys that were given a certain amount of money and, and, and this kind of was a picture of kind of how God all gives us certain responsibilities, certain talents, certain gifts to steward. And then what Jesus told the ones that were um, responsible with it, he said, hey, well done, good and faithful servant. He didn't say well done, good and successful servant. He said well done, good and faithful servant. Servant. Now, all these guys in the story, and this is not the passage we're going to preach from this morning, just kind of going to make a point. All these guys in the story, the ones that were faithful, invested what they were given. They, 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 they let it go for a little bit, and it got a return. So they had to go all in. They had to take a risk. They didn't have any guarantees, and yet Jesus called them faithful. The one that he, what's the word, rebuked, was the one who kind of held on to his stuff and was like, I'm not going to let this go because I might lose it. And Jesus called him disobedient. So, how do, so, so what does it mean to be all in with Jesus in light of no guarantees? I would say it means this. You can write this down. Life rearranged around Jesus' agenda means obedience to Jesus without guaranteed outcomes. Life rearranged around Jesus' agenda means obedience to Jesus without guaranteed outcomes. It may go really awesome for you. Chances are, though, you'll actually experience a lot of difficulty and a lot of challenges, and a lot of pain along the way. After all, Jesus didn't call us to pick up a lazy boy. He called us to carry a cross. So it won't be easy. There won't be any guarantees, but he simply calls us to be obedient without guaranteed outcomes. Here's kind of the good news, though, the thing I find very helpful. This isn't really what I would call blind faith. You might say, what do you mean? You said there weren't any guarantees. Well, Jesus doesn't give us guaranteed outcomes, but he does give us some very helpful guidelines to navigate the unknown. We don't have guaranteed outcomes, but we do have very helpful guidelines. So what we're going to do is we look through the life of the, the kind of the latter stages of Paul's life here is we're going to look at some guidelines that help us navigate 
the unknown and how we begin to learn how to obey even without guaranteed outcomes. These won't be on the screen, but you can write them down. So uh, guideline number one is this, identify the goal. Identify the goal. It's always helpful to have a target to shoot at, right? Right, like this is what confuses me about like T-ball now. Like apparently they don't even keep score, which blows my mind. It's like, how are you even supposed to know if your team is great or if your team sucks? I mean, I, I, mean, I, guess, I, I guess they don't call outs anymore either. They just let them waddle around the bases. It's like, that doesn't even, that doesn't, that doesn't even make sense. It, it makes, it's like playing basketball with no goal. Shoot the ball into the air. Oh, you're a winner. No, if you miss the goal, it's an air ball. And you need to adjust that. Okay? Uh, it, it's helpful to have a goal to shoot for. So, so, so what is the goal that we're shooting for here? Paul explains it as he continues to talk to the Ephesian elders in verse 24. He says, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim, my only goal is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. So here's what Paul said the goal was. It wasn't to get whatever he could out of life. It wasn't for his life to be easy. It wasn't to make a lot of money. It wasn't to have a family. It wasn't to do all this stuff. And none of those things are bad in and of themselves. But he said, man, my life at the end of the day is worth nothing if I don't complete the task that Jesus has given me to do. You, you may want to jot this down, but the quickest way to a wasted life is a life that is disconnected from Jesus and his purposes. It doesn't matter how much fun you have. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter how great your family is. If your life is disconnected from Jesus and his purposes, then you're literally wasting your life. And none of us want to do that. We want our life to matter. And we talked a lot about that in week one of this series, how Jesus, going all in with Jesus, gives us purpose that lasts into eternity. And Paul says, my only aim in life, my only goal in life is to finish the race and complete the task that Jesus has given me. It's simply to do what Jesus told me to do and let Jesus worry about the results. And if that costs me my life, then so be it. Now, how in the world do we move to that posture? How did Paul get to that posture? Paul was there not because he was guilted into doing something for Jesus. He didn't do it because he felt some sort of religious obligation. He did it because he knew Jesus. See, you never really get to this posture of being all in with Jesus until you actually know Jesus. And by the way, that's the goal. Jesus is the goal. Knowing Jesus is the goal. And sometimes I think we forget that in, in, in the middle of even doing a lot of good things. Sometimes I think even reading the Bible or even praying or even coming to church, sometimes we can almost make those things the goal. And those things are great things. Don't get me wrong. You should do them. But those are not the goal. Jesus is the goal. Those are just a means to Jesus. Those are just a way to get close to Jesus. Those are just a way to build our relationship with Jesus because Jesus is the goal. When you understand Jesus is the goal and that he's worth everything, he's even worth your life, then that'll put you in the same posture as Paul to where you're like, hey, you know what? Because I know Jesus and he's worth more than anything and anyone, wherever he tells me to go and whatever he tells me to do, my answer is yes, regardless of the cost. You don't get there because you hear some guy yell at you and guilt you into doing something. And sure, I can do that. I mean, I can preach every week and make, make you feel guilty and you'll go home and maybe spend a couple days reading the Bible and that sort of thing. And then you kind of lose the guilt feeling and then you come back on Sunday and you get guilted again as it kind of goes on and on and on. Don't, don't you get tired of that though? The way you move beyond that, you realize Jesus is the goal. You surrender your life to Jesus. You go all in with Jesus. You commit your life to Jesus. And then that will change your heart to where you're like, you know what, wherever he tells me to go, whatever he tells me to do, the answer is yes, regardless of the cost. 
That's the goal. The goal is to know Jesus. If you know Jesus, then you'll do what he tells you to do because it's just a natural overflow of knowing Jesus. And that don't mean it's easy. My gosh, it's not. But it's not a product of guilt or religious obligation. It's a product of relationship. So let me ask you, let me th think about this for a minute. Why are you here this morning? But like seriously, like, like why are you here sitting in this room listening to some balding guy talk to you? Is it because you feel obligated to do it? Because if you do, like, like that's just kind of, that just, like, you need to find something different to do. Go play golf and be miserable doing that. You know? Or are you here just because it's kind, of, it's kind of what you do? It's kind of a hobby? If this is your hobby, you, you need a better hobby. Are you here because you feel like, well, this is kind of what I should do and I kind of feel guilty when I don't do it? Well, like, don't get me wrong. It makes me feel good for you to be there laughing at my lame jokes. But, but, but if your obligation is you feel kind of, if your motive is you feel kind of obligated to do it, then, then, then that's, not, that's not enough. Your motivation should be, man, I know Jesus, and I love to gather with his people because if you know Jesus, you get a heart for his people. I want to gather with his family. I want to sing and worship and adore him. I want to listen to his word taught so, so that I can grow in my relationship with him. If Jesus is not the goal, then something is deeply broken. Because when he's the goal, then this, then, then this thing, these things we do, they become an overflow. They become very natural, like water coming out of a cup when it's filled up. Why are you here? Is it because you know Jesus, you want to be close to Jesus, you want to be about Jesus' agenda, or is this just kind of your religious thing that you do every week? The goal ain't to come to church. The goal ain't to be religious. The goal is to know Jesus. You know Jesus, you'll do what he asks you to do. Identify the goal. Shoot for it. The second guideline is this. Recognize the obstacles. Some of y'all might say, why don't you put this stuff on the screen? Because I want you to pay attention. That's why. It makes me feel better when you do. Get insecure when you don't. Um, <clears throat> recognize the obstacles. Man, <clears throat> how, I got a question. How many marriages do you think have been saved by Google Maps? <clears throat> <clears throat> I'm serious, man. I'm serious. Because, like... How many of y'all had this experience, either as a child or maybe you lived this experience? Like you riding down the road on vacation, and typically it's the dude driving. It's not just, I'm just going with the stereotype here. Typically it's the dude driving, and you get really close to like you're off the interstate to where now you need directions. And then the wife or the mom tries giving directions, and it turns into this knockdown, drag out brawl in the front seat because the guy don't understand what she's saying. I mean, what else is new, right? Um, and, and like, and it's just mass confusion. Anybody ever seen, like, lived through that example? Yes, yes. How many of y'all have ever been the parents who did that? Out of curiosity, anybody honest in here? Okay, like one hand. And then Google Maps came along. And now you don't have to get mad at your spouse anymore. You just get mad at Siri or Cortana or, or whoever else the government has spying on us or whatever. Um, <laughs> you just get mad at them. But, but here's the nice thing about Google. Like Google Maps, like it'll let you know when like a stoppage is coming. And it's like 16 minutes slowdown. And then sometimes it will show you how to get around it. Or if you don't have a way around it, it just lets you know you're going to be stuck for 30 minutes and you don't have to flip out. But, but some of you do anyway. So maybe that's the, you just got control issues. You need to let it go. Um, we, we love to find a way around obstacles, right? Or at a bare minimum, we would love to get a heads up that obstacles are coming. That, that way we're not caught off guard. And Paul actually gets a bit of a head up, heads up here uh, in Acts chapter 21. Uh, Luke writes, because Luke was the author of Acts, he says, after we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus, how many of y'all would love to name your boy Agabus? <laughs> Probably not. Um, middle school would be awful for him. <laughs> Agabus came down from Judea, coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it. That would be awkward, take Paul's belt off, that was just weird. Um, and he said this, the Holy Spirit says, in this way the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. In other words, Paul, God's saying, you're going go to get, go to Jerusalem and you're going to be arrested. So, verse, uh, verse 12, when we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul 
not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. So Paul gets a heads up. He's like, this guy, Agabus says, hey, the Lord says, if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to get arrested. Now, that, let me just bring up something that will help you reading the Bible. It seems like there's conflicting instructions here. Does it not? Like on the one hand, Paul's compelled by the Holy Spirit to go. On the other hand, the Holy Spirit says, if you go, this is what's going to happen. Some people look at this and say, well, Paul is clearly wrong, but the reality is these are two sides of the same coin. Paul is led by the Spirit. Paul said, go to Jerusalem, or excuse me, God said, Paul, go to Jerusalem. And God also said, Paul, when you go, this is going to happen. They're not conflicting. They're two sides of the same coin. Sometimes in Scripture, things that seem to be conflicting are actually complementary. The reason that is, is because the Bible is not written in a Western American culture where things are often either or. It's written in an Eastern culture where things are often both and. That will help you make sense of the Bible, if you'll understand that. The Bible is not a Western culture book. It's an Eastern culture book. You might say, what does that have to do with the message? Not much. It's just helpful for you to know to read the Bible. So you're welcome. Um, so, so Paul is warned that he gets this heads up and he's still like, hey, you know what? Because my goal is simply to know Jesus and thus do what Jesus told me, told me to do and let the chips fall where they may. Um, I'm simply going to go and obey and let Jesus take care of the results. So that's what he does. And I know some of us may be in here and we may say, well, I wish I got a heads up like Paul. But, but see, the reality is that but we do get a heads up. Like none of these verses will be on screen, but you can, you can jot down the reference. Uh, 1 Timothy 3.12, Paul tells his protege, Timothy, that everyone living a godly life will be persecuted. In other words, if you go all in following Jesus, it ain't going to be sunshine and rainbows and ponies. It's good. Like, there's going to be times where things just don't go your way. In fact, I would even say this. If you've gone like an extended season of your life and everything is hunky-dory and you have zero tension in your life, chances are you're not following Jesus. Because following Jesus creates tension. If it's always comfortable then chances are you're going the wrong way because Satan has absolutely zero interest in making somebody who is going the wrong way uncomfortable because it might turn them back to Jesus. If you follow Jesus, it's going to be tense. In John 16, 33, Jesus promises his disciples. And by the way, we love to talk about the promises of God, right? Like we just do like God is for me. He's with me. He'll take care of me. You know what one of the other promises of God is? That in this world, you will have trouble. Put that on a Christian coffee mug. <laughs> oh, yes, my nasty, which coffee is disgusting anyway. Oh, yes, I'm drinking. Oh, praise God, Jesus, you said in this world I will have trouble. That is awesome. <laughs> Nobody's ever said that, but that's a promise. Jesus said, if you are in this world, you will have trouble. And then in Mark, uh, let's, let me make sure I get the reference right. In Mark 13, 13, great numbers there, so I guess the passage makes sense. Um, <laughs> Jesus told his disciples that everyone will hate you because of me. In other words, if you go all in following Jesus, do not expect life to be easy because it will not be. Do not expect everyone to like you because they won't. You can expect challenges. You can expect opposition. You can expect obstacles. And this is where a lot of us tend to, I think, shrink back because we like, well, I hear obstacles are coming and I don't know how bad it's going to be and you never do, just to let you know. You never know how bad the obstacles are going to be. You just know they're coming. And so many of us hear that and we're like, if that's the case, then I'm out. Because I, I, I don't want to deal with that. But see, here's the thing. Obstacles are going to happen in your life regardless of whether or not you follow Jesus. It's just going to be, it's, it's just going to be a thing. The question is not whether or not you have obstacles. The question is whether or not those obstacles will be redeemed for the glory of God because in Christ, no suffering, no obstacle, no pain is ever wasted. Outside of Jesus, it just becomes this, this giant mess. With Jesus, he can redeem it. And I just want to say this morning that, man, if you're here and you're experiencing tension, you're experiencing pain, you're experiencing obstacles as a function of following Jesus, 
Don't think for a second that means you're going the wrong way. It actually means you're going the right way. Obstacles in our life as a function of following Jesus doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. It means you're making progress. You might say, well, why do I keep going? Because of the third God, the God line. Realize the possibilities. Realize the possibilities. Um, one of the things I've discovered in my life that I enjoy is sushi. Who likes sushi? Show hands. Okay, cool. Who thinks it's disgusting? It's like raw fish. Well, okay, the majority of you. I used to be like 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 the rest of you. Um, I used to like, like my wife liked it. She's like, I want to go out for sushi. I'm like, no, that's like raw fish. That sounds disgusting and gross and, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, eventually, she gently um, reminded me of it over and over and over again. And so eventually, we ended up going out for it. And I started with something cooked like shrimp, which I actually thought was like, oh, wow, this is actually kind of decent. Eventually, I graduated to raw fish, which was actually pretty good, especially with some spicy mayonnaise and a jalapeno on top of it. I don't even need soy sauce anymore. It's absolutely delicious and awesome. And the rest of you are like skeptical. You're like, no, no. No, don't take your pastor's word to the bank for the, on this, by the way. Um, and, and by the way, one thing, totally unrelated to the message. If you're going to try sushi, like, 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 don't do it at a Chinese buffet. <laughs> well, like, like, just don't, just don't. That is not a good representation of it. That, 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 that's like canned tuna, like, just no, no, no. But, uh, but here's what I learned in that. Um, when I finally took a risk and tried it, and I liked it. It was like, wow, I've been missing out, and this is something that is good. And here's what it makes me think of. Like, the relevant question would be this. Man, what are we missing out on because we like to play it safe? Well, I think about it in the context of being all in following Jesus. What are we missing out on because we like to play it safe? We like to keep it secure. We like to only stick with what we know. What are we missing out on? I would say a lot. You might say, well, you said there's no guarantees. There's not. But what if we shifted our mindset to, well, man, I don't know what's going to happen to, but what could happen if I take this step? Trust me, you'll face obstacles along the way, and Paul does face obstacles. So he goes to Jerusalem. Uh, the crowd starts to riot. They try to kill him. He gets thrown in jail. He gets put on trial three times with really no resolution. He's kept in jail for two years by corrupt government officials. Uh, and then he's sent to Rome. On the way to Rome, he is shipwrecked and bitten by a snake. How many of y'all want that life? It's funny. People are like, I want to be like Paul. It's like, really? I'm not so sure I do. <laughs> if for nothing else, the snake bite. I just, no. <laughs> So Paul experiences all that, but then he eventually gets to Rome, and it's really interesting because Paul had been given a desire by God not just to go to Jerusalem, but also to go to Rome, and God uses his trip to Jerusalem to get Paul to Rome, not in the way Paul would have liked to get there, but he gets there anyway, and then in Acts chapter 28, we see this happen. It says, for two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. You might say that's confusing because if he's in his own house, he was under house arrest, he's chained to a guard 24-7, he can't go anywhere. Explain how the gospel goes on, how he teaches unhindered. Well, during Paul's time in house arrest, he wrote four books of the Bible. Ephesians, Philippians, Philemon, and Colossians. And those have gone to every single continent in the world. Do you think Paul imagined that would happen when he was sitting there writing them? I think there were probably moments as Paul was writing this to where he's like, you know what, I wish I could just be there in person. It'd be a lot easier than having to write. I mean, they didn't have Microsoft Word back then. They had to write it with ink and, you know, feather or whatever. It wasn't easy. But now, 2,000 years later, it's gone all over the world. Do you think Paul could have predicted that? Mm -mm. No. See, you can't possibly predict what God might do if you choose to go all in following Jesus. You can't predict it. You can't predict it. And so the question then is, man, what, what are we missing because we choose to play it safe? I don't know. So why play it safe? Why 
Why not rather go all in, take a risk, and see what happens? So the question we've been kicking around all series with, with what we do with this is what's one way I rearrange my life around Jesus' agenda? What's the one way I rearrange my life around Jesus' agenda? And I especially want to talk about that question when it comes to this whole unknown thing. Like, What's one way I can step into the unknown? By the way, Frozen 2 is way worse than Frozen 1. Like just way, way worse. And all, the, and all the parents of small children said amen because there's not an annoying song that kids will gravitate to, right? Um, I had to get that off my chest. Um, but but what's, what's one way I can step into the unknown of following Jesus in, in this case? And then there's maybe, there's maybe a lot of different ways. Maybe you already have an idea. But, but I want to talk about like, like one specific thing that I think encapsulates this risk-taking thing, especially in our context, in our culture. And it would be this. Uh, give generously without guarantee. Oh, the brakes just went on. It's like, not the money talk. And like, hey, if that's you, man, I get it. I so get it. Because we've all heard really bad TV preachers like abuse the topic of money and say, if you spend me, send me $500, I'll send you this magic prayer hanky, and then the prayer hanky doesn't work. And like, if that was you and you've been taken advantage of like that, like, I'm really, really sorry. Like, that wasn't biblical. It shouldn't have happened. Or maybe you've been in a church before where all they talked about was money. They passed the plate like 30 times. They're like, God's going to provide, you know, the budget for this week. Just keep on passing it. We need 50 more dollars. You know, somebody, and then you're kind of like, fine, I'm just tired of doing this. So, so, so this is something that, that, that we kind of have, you know, we get nervous talking about it, right? Because it's a topic that's been abused and it's been talked about in a way that, that is simply not biblical many, many times. So... Why are we talking about it? Well, a couple of reasons. Um, the, the first one would be this. Well, one of the things we one of the things we like to say, one of the things we like to say often is that um, you're not all in until you're bought in. You might say, explain that. Okay. Um, I like to go to Chick Fil A, which requires me spending money on their chicken nuggets. Now, I can give my time to go to Chick-fil-A and sit in there and be like, hey, Chick-fil-A, it's awesome. I can even offer them my talent as, as a legendary eater of chicken nuggets. Once upon a time, I ate 36 at one point, and it was great. Um, but, um, but, but until I actually pony up and pay, then I'm not really all in on Chick-fil-A's mission, right? That's, that, that's kind of the idea, right? You're not all in until you bought it. So in, in the same way, man, are we really all in until we're bought in with, with Jesus' mission? The answer would be no. And the second reason would be that this is not about a, this is not about money, not really. Like God's not after your money; He's after your heart. And Jesus taught that where your um, where your treasure goes, your heart follows. He didn't say where your heart is is where your money goes. He said where your money goes, that's the direction your heart gravitates towards. So until your until your money is invested in, in Jesus kingdom through the local church, Jesus says, your heart's never going to be drawn to my mission. Your heart's going to be drifting from me. Now, I'm going to be honest, as a church, honestly, we, we do a pretty good job of this. We do a great job of this, quite honestly. But I think the tension for many of us is, is getting to this place to where we're giving generously without guarantee. It's really easy to give out of, out of like, abundance. It's much more difficult to get to a place to where you're starting to give sacrificially. So, if you want a really practical next step, the, the idea would simply be this. Um, increase your giving by 1%. 1%. Like if you're giving 10%, give 11. If you're giving 5%, give 6. If you're giving 0%, give 1. And I know sometimes it won't make sense on paper. In fact, most of the times it won't, quite honestly. But, um, but man, I, what I can tell you is this. When we start going all in with Jesus, we'll see Jesus begin to work in and through our lives in ways that we're completely unpredictable. And I know for me and my wife, every single time God has called us to give in a significant way, it's always created some tension for us. It's always created concern like, well, what are we going to do if X, Y, Z happens? But I can say, man, every single time we've, got, we've seen God come through in a way that was completely unexpected. And y'all, that doesn't just apply to the money thing. That applies to all of following Jesus. When you go all in, when you step into the unknown without any guarantees, man, you'll see Jesus 
do some things that, that are completely unpredictable. For instance, in Philippians chapter 4, one of the letters Paul wrote in prison, he said this, All God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. Man, even the people in the emperor's own house heard the gospel and responded to the gospel. The seeds that would ultimately undermine the whole of the Roman Empire were planted during Paul's time in Rome. That never could have been predicted. You have no idea what might happen when you step out of safety, out of certainty, out of security, and into the unknown of following Jesus. But what I can almost guarantee will happen is this. You'll see Jesus do something in a major way that you never saw coming. And I would even go as far to say this. If you ever want to be used in a major way by God, like not that God can't use you where you are, He will, but if you ever want to be used in a major, significant way by God, it's going to require you stepping into something that is completely unknown. And then trusting Him. The thing that will keep us from that is a love for safety, a love for security, a love for certainty. That will always limit you. Step out of the known and step into the unknown and let's see what God might possibly do. You know who this applies very, very specifically for in a lot of ways? Those of you who have yet to give your life to Christ. Here's why you don't. Because you know what it's like living life as, as you're living right now. You know what it's like to put on the religious face but then not think about Jesus once you leave here. You know what it's like to fake it in front of everybody that's a Christian. If you're not in a religious context, if you come from a very unchurched background, church in your background, you know what your life is like living like with your own sin, your own problems. And you'd maybe say, well, I don't like this, but at least I know it. There's some of you in here, you'd say, I don't like acting like I'm something I'm not. I don't like acting like a Christian when I know I'm not, but I know what that's like. Embracing the known over the unknown, it's not only going to rob you of like purpose and hope in life, it's going to rob you of joy in eternity. And you might say, well, I don't know what following Jesus will, will involve what do you have to lose? Because, yeah, there's no guarantees beyond the fact that He'll bring you home to Him one day in eternity. But, man, how might God change your life if you stop faking it, if you stop running from Him, and you say, Jesus, I'm done running and I'm yours? Well, God, what might God do?